Perfect. Okay. So welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Megan Horn. I'm an associate principal at Studio MLA and I am vice president of AWAF. Um, we're here to talk about our fellowship and what's really exciting to the awards team and the board at large is we've shifted around a couple things in that um, there's a potential for two awards this year, one 5,000 and one 2,500. And we've shifted our application um, process to make it a rolling application. So um, the hope is that's gonna be more attractive where there's not a um, really a hard deadline and people can submit it um, at their own leisure throughout the year. That said, we do have a deadline of um, March 1st coming up for this year's fellowship. So if you don't make it, you can always apply to next year, um, but we're really hoping um, that we'll get an amazing list um, of applicants. All right, so with that, I'm gonna pass it over to the co-chairs, um, Natasha and Issa. All right, thanks, Megan. Um, my name is Issa, and I'm, I'm one of the co-chairs of the uh, awards committee. Um, so this is falling under the umbrella of the foundation side for AWA. Uh, I'm currently an architect with Arcadis, and or formerly known as IBI Group. And primarily I've been working on K through 12 projects and I have a focus on comprehensive modernization. So kind of taking existing campuses and bringing them up to um, you know, 21st century uh, standards. So um, with that, Natasha, if you can quickly introduce yourself as well. Thanks, Isa. Um, hi everyone, I'm Natasha. Um, I am a I'm very excited actually this year to be co-leading the awards committee with Isa. Um, it's been a joy and really, really fun. Um, I'm a landscape architect and director of Project Samsara. I'm also a lecturer at Cal Poly Pomona and where I teach landscape and urban design studios and concerning things like community engagement tools, um, and really trying to get students to understand and develop alternative ways of knowing and representing landscapes. Great, and so with that, we'll jump into some introduction of our uh, panelists. So we'll start with Janica. Hi everyone, um, I'm Janica Lay Baker. I am an associate principal at NAC Architecture. Um, and um, I'm also the president of the Asian American Architects and Engineers Foundation and on the board of um, the Asian American Architects and Engineers Association. Um, and I see some familiar faces here. So it's really nice to see everyone, um, everyone in this room. Um, should I introduce my project a little bit or we'll, just we'll get about into myself? that. Just, okay. We'll just start with the individual for right now. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Well, that's me. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. And next we'll go to Audrey. Hi, I'm Audrey Sato. Um, I'm the principal and founder of Sato Architects Inc. Um, I was a president of AWA Plus D and um, now am also a mom of a two-year-old. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thanks, Audrey. Uh, next, we'll go to Claire. Hi, I'm Claire Latine. I'm an associate professor and chair of landscape architecture at Cal Poly Pomona. I'm a mom of three grown kids, which got me into the research that I do on designing schools to support mental health and well being. Great, thank you. Uh, next, Ashley. Hey everyone, I'm Ashley Margo. I am a lead designer and teaching artist um, in media arts at Inner City Arts. Great, thanks. And next is Melissa. Hey, I am an architect at Shed Architecture, where I describe my role sometimes as a catch-all because I do design, but I do strategy and operations and marketing as well. So we're a small firm, so it's nimble. Um, it is single family, so that also is kind of the realm that I'm working in. And then I have Studio Serpentine, which is where my like where I get to experiment and do furniture design and alternative stuff that 
in the studio maybe be risky, but I can kind of play with it on my own. So that's me. <laughs> Thanks. And last but not least is Neely. Hi, I'm Ismaili. Um, I am a project captain at DGA Plus. Uh, firm uh, the firm specializes in affordable housing, K-12. Um, I'm also an adjunct professor at Woodbury University. I uh, have taught at Santa Monica College as well. Um, and yeah, and I'm last year's um, fellowship recipient. So I'm uh, excited to share with you all. Thank you. Um, so with that, we're just going to jump into our roundtable discussion. So I'll ask each of you to do a brief presentation on your individual um, fellowship projects that you'd worked on. And for Smiley, that's in progress. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen here so that you guys can do so. Okay. Are you guys seeing my screen? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Uh, so we'll start with Janica. Um, so the the project that um, my actually partner and I put together for the 20, it looked like it was the 2016 awards. It was the first one that um, AWAF uh, put on for, 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 for this group of, of, um, of people of kind of the first inaugural grants um the uh when i first started my career um it was in k-12 education and i did a lot of master planning for lausd and the prompts that they gave us for this master planning effort it was always a little bit more limited than what my colleague and i wanted to explore and so when this grant opportunity came up, we took this as um, as a way to kind of scratch that itch of trying to do more and explore more about what LAUSD campuses um, could do in kind of more broadly. Um, and so we took this chance to look at all of the different campuses that LAUSD has, and LAUSD is actually one of the largest landowners in LA County. Um, and this is this is what we called it 12, 1200 play yards There are about 1200 campuses um, across LA County that LUSD is responsible for for uh, for taking care of. And we looked at the different makeups of each of each of the campuses and the opportunities that they um, they would have in transforming LA County at large from a sustainability perspective, um, from the perspective of how they serve the children that attend the campuses. Um, and instead of looking at each campus individually, it was looking at how they can link um, across the entire county. Um, and what this uh, opportunity gave us too was the ability to um, uh, to interview different people that worked in the same space and to put a panel discussion together. Um, and so it was it was a really great opportunity for us to do things that we couldn't do within the workspace um, and within the workplace with our clients. Um, and it was it was a really great year long exploration doing this. All right, thank you. Um, I think something happened to my presentation, so I'm I'm just gonna pull up each of yours individually now. <laughs> um, so it might take a little second to get set up. Let's try. Okay, so next we'll go into Audrey's. Hi. Yeah. So my um my fellowship project was the XXLA Architects podcast, um, uh, which was a podcast based on interviews and in-depth conversations with women in and around the built environment in Los Angeles specifically, because a lot of these interviews um, prior to the pandemic, they all happened in person. Um, and so the project ended up, although I had initially um, proposed one a month for the fellowship year, so 12 episodes, I actually I think I had something like 37, 37 episodes at the end. And they encompass not just like one-on-one -on -one interviews, but also some live events that we put on um, throughout the year plus as well. Um, so this is just kind of 
that was like some of the women that were featured. Um, and then this is the impact that that project actually had, um, which, you know, was uh, at this point is 120 countries, which is kind of incredible that um, even though it was an extremely like hyper local focused uh, project that, you know, it has so many, it has touched so many people around the world. Um, and the, I, I included this last slide, which was one paragraph of my fellowship application, um, because it had kind of the meat of what the description of my project would be. Um, the, the project, I thought it would be interesting for you guys, if you're planning on applying the, um, when I was applying for this project, I had a little bit of like self, self-doubt of like, why would, why is this project important? Is this just me feeling like I need more, more mentorship, more, you know, I want more access to women. Is anyone else feeling that? And is this like valid? It seems, it seemed like maybe a touchy feely project that I was I was like feeling intimidated about, but I went ahead and applied anyway, and I got it, and I'm so glad that I did because it's really um, made a huge impact on my life and um, hopefully others as well. But I wanted to include this because out of the two pages before this statement, I was going into the why why this project is needed, why it matters. And then after this paragraph, I went into detail of like what um, I envisioned the project to be in a little bit more detail. And I just wanna note that like in the application, I had said that two episodes would diverge from the interview format to be more in guess investigative. That never happened. And I think um, it's also really good to note that once you get into the project, I think there's room to change and um, kind of go with it as as things develop, and as you find out what works uh, for you. Um, and it still makes a valid project. So anyway, that's why I included that information. All right, thank you. And next we'll move on to Claire's project. So my application was for really diving into how to design design strategies for schools that support students' mental health and well-being. And I was well into this larger project um, because I had just finished a year de developing this presentation for the love of teenagers through Landscape Architecture Foundation, uh, mid-career fellowship for innovation and leadership. And where I had gotten with that, if you go to the next slide, was, um, but at the end of that year, I had identified a bunch of obstacles to designing schools to support mental health and well-being, and made some proposals of what need, needed to be done with it. Um, I had received an invitation from Island Press to do a book proposal on um, designing K through 12 schools with mental health in mind. And I was really stuck on the design strategies, the specific design strategies. So I wrote an AWAF proposal to develop those design strategies. And I think those are on the next slide. Um, yeah, so I really benefited from mentorship and prodding and kind of conversation around what these design strategies should be based on the 50 years of research that I was kind of summarizing. So I got to these general, um, the three general themes of student engagement, evidence-based security design and mind, body environment by the end of that year. And then if you go to the next slide, once I started writing it, writing it all down and kind of thinking it through and doing a, a building on that work from this fellowship, the final ones, the final design strategies fell into these three buckets, nurture belonging, provide nature full places and inspire awe. And those are the 12 design strategies that are described. 
in um, Schools That Heal, which is the book that came out of both of these fellowships. And that's the final slide. So it was a really pivotal and important moment where I was extremely stuck <laughs> in the process and received the mentorship and support and just time, financial support and time to think it through. Okay, great. Thank you, Claire. And um, next, I'm going to pull up Ashley's presentation. All right. Uh, so my project is called Los Angeles by Color. Oh, um, actually, your oh. little your voice is a little faint. Oh, faint. Can you hear me better now? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, so my project is called Los Angeles by Color, and I started it four years before I applied uh, to the fellowship. It started out um, as a way to connect with the city and experience it in a different way with friends. Um, so I proposed a group of friends to select a color. And based on their color, um, they would go on a surprise tour of the city. Um, so then we go to the next slide. Um, oh, back one. So um, 16 unique tours were designed for different individuals um, where there was like an element of play um, and just experiencing the city in a different way. Um, so these tours examined over 100 different locations that varied in historical significance, economic development, and cultural function. Um, but while we were going about our day and experiencing these tours, um, I didn't really have an end goal in mind, um, but I was taking pictures along the way. Um, and so I had kind of like all of this data with me from these four years of Los Angeles uh, when I applied to the fellowship. Um, so initially, my proposal was that this would be some sort of like mapping project. Um, and then if we we'll go to the next slide, um, but kind of through uh, my uh, fellowship time, I started to like break down more closely the different buildings um, and experiences that we had had. And um, so I had a portion where um, as you can see here that it was looking a bit more closely at um, just like very specifics of each of the places that were visited. Um, but ultimately by the end of the um, fellowship, I had ended up transforming what I'd collected into these color ribbons that we'll see on the next slide, um, which are a spatial embodiment of LA that we'll never actually see, but it's a frozen moment of time of LA from um, 2016 to 2019. Um, and as we all know, it's a city that's too vast and also rapidly changing that we'll never fully grasp it. Um, so again, these ribbons just become this like moment in time of a different way to see and organize the city. And I also feel like um, that it's able to celebrate not only those who built and designed it, but also those who maintain and inhabit and move throughout our city um, every single day. And then we'll see on my last slide that um, it's also, I've continued to work with um, not only like these different pieces that were collected, um, but also like interacting um, with placement and um, just how I'm going about my time in Los Angeles um, every day. Okay, thank you. Uh, all right, next we have Melissa. Uh, just a second. Cool. Okay. So my project was um, where I was at whenever I was uh, applying was I work in single family residential and at, it was after COVID and um, it was like a culmination of just like construction prices were really high and even just for like stick framing and stuff like that plus the culmination of just like feeling way more visible in the city like the housing crisis and so being a person that's yeah I don't even need to hide my age I'm 35 of like 
you know, I'd love to own a home sometime. Just really feeling kind of the effects of the city personally, but also in observation. So I just kind of was wanting to see, like, are there alternative ways of building that isn't $800 a square foot for a single family residential home? So that was, um, and also sprinkling in the idea of, like, um, thinking about design that it can be affordable and not just at a higher sticker price as well. So that's kind of what was the catalyst of what I jumped into. And the next slide was me just kind of breaking down the process of what I then went forward with was just like, I had a friend that we partnered kind of up with this project because um, he had a 3D printer, concrete 3D printer. And so we really tested out of like, building a small structure, a hundred square foot structure. And what is the process of like pretty much turning it into these big Lego blocks versus printing on site and using readily accessible things like a forklift and a regular, like, um, you know, obviously it has to be a certain weighted like truck and stuff like that. So we literally printed the thing that's kind of below there was openings and stuff, but we kept it real minimal because the budget was real minimal. So the next slide kind of just shows that this is us printing, shipping, and then starting to install inside. So what was great from this experience, I mean, what was great from the fellowship is I really gained an experience. Like I was able to then use this to be like, this is a process. This is a system. We built it for X. Um, and it's kind of cool. It's not, the contract isn't signed yet, but um, I've been just working with, and it's, I shouldn't say it's not signed yet. Hopefully it is by tomorrow, but developing a, an affordable housing unit. Um, so anyways, the project is developing, they print, pretty much taking this project and scaling it up a little bit for a 600 square foot unit that's for affordable housing, um, as a, um, like rent to own, own situation. So what I'm trying to articulate in a short period of time is like, it was really great that this was quite ambitious of what I did. And I, and it's great because that gave me the step up to then be able to have this opportunity of really kind of fulfilling that dream of can, is there alternative solutions of building affordable? So I'll get into it later, some comments on it. So I'll leave it at that. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Thanks, Melissa. All right. And then last but not least, we have Ismaili. Um, the wrong screen. Here we go. Um, hey, um, I'm going to maybe read a little bit as uh, as the work is still in progress and I'm trying to give the elevator pitch uh, a few a few rounds, uh, so I'll practice again one more time here. So I think the, the project is called Mapping Resistance Highland Park. So um, the, um, I'm just gonna read a little bit here. Gentrification is not just an economic process, but also a cultural one that involves the, the displacement of existing communities and their cultural practices. Art and cultural production are often seen as a threat to gentrification because they provide a space for communities to assert their identities and resist the dominant narratives of development and progress. So um, one of the big driving forces of the project is this kind of relationship of gentrification and culture um, and identity of, of a particular neighborhood. So again, you know, what is, how do we combat the effects uh, of gentrification through the lens of um of culture um and so the one of the the question is through a range of uh, visual and community based events walking tours and exhibitions the project will examine the ways in which art activism architecture urban design can be used to, together to resist gentrification and build stronger and more resilient communities the exhibition uh mentioned uh, and events will also seek to unearth histories the archive and narratives, narratives of this community as a way of creating what I'm calling, quoting Dana Koff, a thick map of visual narratives and knowledge of Highland Park. So the map that you see on the screen uh, was a was a graphic that we produced to, to kind of indicate that just along this Figueroa uh, corridor, 
um, the um, the images that are or the text that are um, in black have all been either demolished or have taken uh, other identi identities when they were kind of key cultural spaces in in the history of Highland Park. And so, you know, how do we understand this this kind of act of erasure um, of communities? And again, and how do we preserve um, those unspoken narratives that are part of maintaining uh, the identity of a place is really at the heart of what the project um, seeks to to kind of um, explore. So that's a, a little bit of, of my project. All right. Thank you all for sharing. I know it's probably nice to kind of reflect and it's it's also great to see the variety of projects that we had and they're all so different from each other. And I think that's something we want to emphasize as well for future applicants is we're really looking for any ideas out there that you might have. It's pretty open-ended, the application, and um, that's intentional. We're looking for your creativity and for you to see what sparks joy and what you want to explore. I'll stop sharing and Natasha. All right. Um, okay, so um, continuing on with the next question, um, which I'm going to pitch to Ismaili who just spoke about um, a really fascinating project and also to Claire and to Janica. Um, so based on what you all just told us about your projects, what inspired you to apply for the fellowship? Maybe you already mentioned a little bit of this, but if there's anything else. Um, and where were you in your career when you applied? So you, I think you skimmed a little bit of that question already, but if there's anything that else that you can offer, uh, we'd love to hear it. Maybe I can, since I just want, I can kind of continue on a little bit on the thread. Um, I think the, as I mentioned in in briefly, I think this topic of gentrification um, in is obviously all around the world and in the city, uh, nothing new. Um, I was particularly interested in in really kind of honing in in, in this part of speaking about culture, right? And in that sometimes in our as we're kind of spatial thinkers. Um, a, a really deep understanding of kind of community and, and their history sometimes gets a little bit diluted, right, in, in the conversations about kind of space making. Um, and so uh, that was really uh, interesting for me. And um, I am an immigrant myself. And, and so that also lens allowed me to to look at a place like Highland Park and really understand what, for example, you know, open up opening up an art gallery would mean in a place like this, right? That like, are we talking about the white cube or do we actually understand um, you know, what a community service, a community center, for example, would could provide that is that is not just a space for kind of viewing and consuming art, but that it could also be a place for you know gathering for quinceañeras for you know so like how do how do we talk about these two things um uh, together um and uh beyond the threshold of even building but again kind of extending it to to uh kind of the urban realm um and where I am in my career I'm uh, a kind of junior designer project manager uh project captain rather at GGA plus in so the office is is really uh interested in in this topic also of you know community and social the, the relationship of architectural community and and the social so i'm i'm very much trying to also think about all those things uh in the work that i do on a daily basis yeah thank you so much i can follow that um so for for me i mentioned it a little bit during um the intro but uh and some of you may have encountered this too is after graduating i i did this right pretty much a right after graduating um maybe i had a year or two under my belt um in the office 
there was a disconnect between real project work and what we were able to explore at school. And I was really missing that just unbounded, no rules exploration. And for those of you who have worked with maybe LAUSD or other school districts in the past, there are just lots of constraints. You know, um, the client wants, wants what they want. And although they are, they've got huge, huge aspirations and goals, they weren't necessarily what I was interested in 100%. And so uh, applying for this fellowship allowed me and, and Kate Harvey, who is um, now a creative director at Rios, um, she and I were able to do this play thing on the side in order to help fuel that other piece that we wanted to, um, that we wanted to feed. And it helped us be more encouraged and be more fulfilled in the workplace too. So being able to do that on the weekends and then be able to go back to work and, and face the real life, real world challenges of how to, um, uh, of how to realize a project and get it built. That was a really good balance for us. Um, and where we were in our career, it was it was a bit different for her and I. Um, I was a designer, maybe verging on job captain, um, and she had been um, a landscape architect for a few years now. Um, at at that point, um, and she actually had young children while we were doing this, um, and I actually found out that. I was going to have a child in the middle of doing this. And so for those of you who have um, those family commitments or other other things that you have going on in your life, it's absolutely uh, uh, possible to do both. Um, but you do have to manage your time properly, which I might get into those lessons learned, learned later on in, in another question. Um, but yeah, that's- That sounds great. Yeah. I would love to hear it. <laughs> All right, thanks. And Claire? Anyone? Yes, I think I had been practicing landscape architecture for about 12 years when I applied. And um, it, it, when I was finishing the, the other fellowship, I really hadn't considered doing these fellowships as a way to change my career trajectory, but I was definitely looking for some... Um, just some intellectual challenge and maybe some ownership of an idea that is hard to maintain in practice when you're in a practice with a lot of other people, you're not a principal, you're not an owner. So I was definitely looking for those, those things. And because I had this book proposal um, opportunity I started when I applied for the AWAF fellowship, I was starting to think about transitioning into academia. Um, so it was all that, that was a really nice way to explore a topic and explore. Um, I think I was, I had just given notice at Studio MLA and I had was starting to lecture at Cal Poly Pomona and I was really trying to figure it out, out. Like, is this the kind of thing I want to do? Do I want to do a deep dive into a topic like, like, um, like this and do more writing and presenting. And so the fellowship was a way to kind of deepen that exploration and have some frankly, the weight of a selected fellowship behind me, like, okay, AWAF believes in this idea and this topic and me as a, as a somebody um, pursuing this topic, that really meant a lot. And like I said, it was Lee's actually kind of, um, I couldn't have done it without the support of the AWAF board and Lee's Bornstein in particular, um, really, got me through the hard, the hard, a couple of hard challenge, like just decision-making things that I was on the fence on. So, yeah. Awesome. That's great. Uh, 
All, All right. right. I think we'll go into our next question now. Um, this is going to be for Ashley and for Audrey. Um, how and where did your project topic develop prior to applying for the fellowship? So whoever wants to go first. Sure. Um, so I think like a lot of other people have kind of mentioned, um, and I did also when um, I was introducing my project that this was something that I started independently three years before I applied to the fellowship. Um, it was at a point where I was like 10 years living in Los Angeles. Um, and I was realizing that, oh, going to certain parts of town because of different obligations, because of work and friends, and like, how do you really get yourself out of those ingrained patterns um, and see the city, not only for the spaces, but also thinking about routes. Um, and then I've always just really been interested in learning Los Angeles, um, not through being on your phone for navigation. Um, so those like three years of navigating and driving around the city also, um, again, were presenting challenges of like really learning um, navigation through the city, even if you get lost sometimes, um, which I do like to do. Um, and then also, my background, um, like my formal education is in architecture, um, but I've worked in entertainment and in AEC and education. Um, and so this fellowship um, and this exploration has also always just been a way to kind of still continue to ground me um, in thinking about like the built environment, um, even if I'm not like fully integrated in um, that field. And um, so, yeah, that's where I was. Yeah, and for me, the project came about, I think, similar to a lot of people where, um, particularly because this was so um, self-motivated by um, an idea of, I need more mentorship, I need more access to more, all these incredible women in Los Angeles. Um, I, I, I think, you know, my project came out of a pivot point where I was wondering, am I going to keep doing what I'm doing with this small business that I'm running? Do I want to rejoin a firm? How do I start a family if I want one um, with this career? Because I had a hard time imagining that. Um, and just, you know, what are the different ways to do things? I, I was a product of graduating during the recession. So I didn't get a lot of early experiences working for a lot of people. I didn't get a lot of mentorship in general and, and not from many women. So um, that's really where the project came out of for me. And um, I think that it, it was useful for me, but it was also so something that could be useful for others. Um, and it really influenced the direction that I decided to take with my life. So that's... Um, yeah, that's the short of it. Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, very well said. Um, all these answers are amazing because we could ask like 10 more questions to add on to each, but <laughs> no time. <laughs> um, okay, so this one is for Ashley and for Claire. Um, what was the outcome of your project and how has it impacted the work that you're doing now? Um, so I guess the physical outcome of this project was having um, like pieces to show because before it was more of just an idea. Um, and also even just applying for the fellowship uh, was the first time that I had shared this idea outside of like the initial people that I had invited on the tours. Um, so I think even throughout the fellowship, um, and since then, it's giving me a lot more opportunities to talk about the project um, and share it with more people. Um, and then currently, um, I've been, again, like thinking a lot about what it means to like navigate and look around in your everyday environment. Um, so with my high school interns that I work with, I have like eight this year. Um, I'm starting a new or I've started a new project where they get like a specific um, starting out with color uh, for what they're looking for each week. And by the end of the year, it's going to turn into something visual. Not sure yet, um, but I'm excited to see what they come up with at the end of this year. 
<laughs> For me, I touched on it a little bit in the, in my slides, but the outcome was really a set of design strategies that I started testing and presentations related to my topic, um, schools that heal. And it was, I mean, how it has impacted the work I'm currently doing, It it is still the central part of the work I do, of everything I do related to my scholarship, related to my academic position. So I run a um, consultancy around designing schools to support mental health, which includes community outreach. It includes partnering with my research collaborator, Marcy Rainey, who's done before and after studies on social and physical behavior of students on schools that have been transformed um, with green schoolyards. It includes um, a studio that I run at both the graduate and undergraduate levels that where we partner landscape architecture students with schools and nonprofit organizations. Um, like this past fall, we partnered 40 landscape architecture students with three, four nonprofit community organizations and eight LA Unified schools to um, work with teachers and students to reimagine their schools. And, and then I continue getting just, it's kind of exploded after um, Lee's put my the, my feet to the fire and was just like, but the design principle, the design strategies, people want concrete how to design the schools because I kept kind of dancing around that part. I wanted to talk about the research and the why, but she was just like, you need this strategy. So I can't even, I can't emphasize enough how transformative that was in, in the life of schools that heal the book and in my life, it impacts it every single day. That's great. Thank you for sharing, Claire. Um, next, our next question is going to go to Melissa and to Janica. Uh, given all that you had learned during the fellowship, what would you do differently if you were to submit again? Janica, do you want to go first or me? You can go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, mine's kind of easy. I thought I could do everything but I couldn't <laughs> like the scale was so big and it's the good thing. I think I can't remember who mentioned it. I think it was you, Audrey. That was like the brief can change while you're in it. The brief changed. So I, um, I mean, and that was great that people were flexible and, and um, didn't hold my feet to the fire so firmly, but you know, there was still a really good product that came to the end of it. And I think that would just be the summary of what I would do differently is just like maybe manage my own personal expectations better. It's hmm. a good one. Um, I think what I would do differently is probably um, spend a bit more time thinking about how to make the end product really tangible. Something that is is beyond the research and just the idea of oh it would be fun if I did this but to to have um to have the end goal of something that you can leave with a community and have it speak for itself in a way so you know having the book and having the podcast and those are definitely things that will live beyond you. Um, and and so in the middle of our year of doing the work, there was a bit of a scramble of, okay, how do we make this tangible? And how do we, what's the best way to present our research? Um, and so that, that was a bit stressful. <laughs> um, but also think about how to manage your time. You know, you put, you put your prompt together, but there is also a whole year of making a schedule for yourself and managing that time and giving yourself tasks and, and, and milestones um, because it is a project and depending on how, hopefully you're all very passionate about it because you kind of have to be to get through. Um, 
to 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 set set aside the time necessary in order to do your work justice. Um, and so I, I would have spent a bit more time thinking about that. All right. Um, next question is going to be about um, advice for future applicants. Um, so this is for Audrey and for Claire, but if anybody else also, if anything came to your mind, feel free to share openly. Um, what advice would you give to future fellowship applicants? I see Audrey not turning off her mute, so I'll go, I'll, <laughs> I'll jump in. I would say, I mean, to follow up on what Janica was saying, really figure out what your burning question is. What is some something that just you can't not ask? Um, follow your curiosity, but also, you know, it's, a, it's, I think it's important to take note of how many of the fellows were either new parents or found out they were gonna be parents or were thinking about how to be parents in this design profession, which is so challenging um, in terms of work-life balance. And I think I'm bringing that up because I would encourage people to bring their whole selves to their topic. And when when I introduced myself as a mom, my kids are in their 20s, but having having the, my three children while I was in grad school and working, starting this design profession with kids already changed my whole career trajectory and made it impossible not to think about them and work around them in my career. Um, and I think that was what that did was I was a mom first. And so being a mom shaped my, all of, all of my work, it shaped the work projects I was interested in and the, in practice, it shaped this project for sure. Um, and it shaped how I see the world as a designer. So I would figure out whether, it, whether you want to be a mom, whether you are a parent, whether you are a pet parent, whether you are burning to save, you know, tra transform the marketplace, whatever it is that just keeps you up at night, make sure that, that you include that part of you, even if it doesn't feel related to design or architecture. Um, it probably is, because I think everything's related to design, right? So figure out what that is and then follow that. Yeah, I think that passion is very incredibly important. I don't think m me knowing my time limits as a parent and a business owner right now, I probably I wouldn't apply for the fellowship in my life at this moment, just because I know I don't have time for much of anything else. Um, <laughs> not even like an hour of Netflix or something. Um, <laughs> so like that, you know, but I, I really admire everyone else who has done that. Um, that's incredible. Uh, I, I would say that the, the advice I have besides being passionate and being realistic about what you can do, um, with the time that you have, because for example, the investigative journalism, like episodes I was thinking I might do. I mean, just putting together a regular inter interview episode was at least 10 hours a week or a month, sorry, of work. And so how was I going to do an, a, like, I don't know, a hundred hours? Like, what is that, you know, for one episode? Um, I think that that was not realistic, but I didn't know that going in. Um, it was doing an, an interview episode and realizing how um, time intensive it was to edit sound, um, to put together graphics, to figure out how to post podcasts and have them picked up by the world and, you know, stuff like that. So, um, I think it's, it's great to dream big. And then part of it is just, you won't know. The other thing, piece of advice is to definitely yeah. lean on the network. You will be, um, now that will be available to you through AWA, um, because, Lease was incredibly important to my success as well. And 
was so did, did her guidance was given with such a kind but direct hand that um I, I I just think she's amazing and she also connected me to a lot of the first interviewees on the, on the podcast who wouldn't have taken me seriously without that introduction so um I think we often as these architects, landscape architects, designers, we think that we can do it all and we can learn all the skills we need to and we can produce everything that we need to when really that's what this money is for. Like we should hire somebody to do graphics if we need it or edit a podcast <laughs> or whatever it is. And so I think um, don't be shy to ask for help. Thanks, Audrey. Uh, all right, so um, before we open up the Q&A, uh, we have one last question, and this is for all of our panelists, and it is if you can share a favorite book or magazine or podcast um, with us and our audience, um, what would it be? And so why don't we start from our most recent winner, we'll, so start, we'll start with Ismaili and then we'll go around to Janica at the end. Cool. Um, okay, so I listen to a lot of podcasts, so I'm just gonna just say two. Um, <laughs> one of them is 99% Invisible, which I'm sure a lot of you might already know. The other one uh, is called On Being uh, with Krista Tippett. It's one of my, also one of my all time favorite podcasts. I uh, really recommend it. Um, and then books, because of just the topic of my research and, you know, my interest is Architectures of Spatial Justice, uh, Dana Kaus' latest uh, book, really amazing uh, kind of summary of, of the work that she's been doing at um, UCLA City Lab. Uh, so that, that, that would be my three. Thank you, Melissa. The a publication that I'm heavily following or subscribe to right now is called The Local Project. Um, it's based in Australia and kind of New Zealand area, but it's really nice to see kind of what residential projects are being produced in that area. And then my like all time favorite book is Ways of Seeing by John Berger, because it's just like a really interesting way to like think about perception and stuff like that. So. Awesome. Um, Ashley? Uh, my go-to podcast is This American Life. Um, I'm always very inspired by their stories and just learn a lot. Um, and it's also random yet not, um, which I also enjoy. And then um, a book right now that I actually just started on that I'm very excited about is The Art of Color by Kelly Grovier. And it's about the history of color um, in art. And uh, Claire? <clears throat> I have, I definitely am a reader more than a podcaster, but um, so I've read a ton of really amazing books the last few years, but the most, the one that keeps sticking in my head and I keep recommending to people is Being Human by Judy Human. Came out last year and I just can't recommend it enough. It's about transformation. It's about, it just, you know, I thought I was aware of accessibility rights history. No, I knew nothing. I feel like I just, it was, and it was beautifully written. I mean, if you're a reader, it, it was one I could not stop reading. I think I read it in like a day and a half. Wow. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Claire. And Audrey? Um, I would definitely echo 99% Invisible. I also um, love Fresh Air and um, How I Built This, just because I think that all the stories like are of these incredible people who've achieved these really great entrepreneurial things, but they also talk about the huge challenges and like major mistakes they've made along the way. So I think that's really great. Awesome. Yeah. And Jenica. Um, I really love listening to The Moth a lot. It's just a lot of really great storytellers and it um, 
inspires me to think that I might have good stories to tell sometimes. Um, and, uh, and I, I recently, I don't read anymore. I listen to audiobooks. Um, I recently listened to, uh, crying in H Mart and I thought that was a really great story. What was the first one you mentioned? The moth. The moth. Okay. Yeah. All righty. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for a wonderful discussion. Um, there's, a lot to pull from. And as you know, we there, we issued a blog post about this event last year. So we'll be doing the same thing this year. Um, and I think today we got a lot of different perspectives than, than previous year. So um, look forward to that. And we will also share a recording of this event once um, once it's finished processing. Thanks for organizing everything. So good to see everyone. Yeah, so before we before we end, um, we just want to open up the floor for any questions. Um, I posted in the chat several, a couple of different links about AWAF and then about this year's application. Um, but we'll stay on for a little while. If you have questions, um, you can put them in the chat or uh, you can just unmute yourself and we're happy to, to help. Oh, hi, everybody. So great to um, see all these great stories of these projects. Um, I, I, it seemed like most people were from the LA area. Just wanted to check, um, is there any benefit? Um, so I, I'm not in LA, I'm a Bay Area um, design person. Uh, is Should I apply or is this really more focused on LA um, professionals? No, it's certainly not just for LA people uh, or Southern California. Um, we welcome applications from anywhere in California. So yeah, if you have an idea, Annie, we would love to see um, more Bay Area participation and um, would definitely encourage uh, the involvement. So yeah, we welcome anywhere from California. Okay. I think if there's any other questions as well. Um, you oh, Joanne. Also... Joanne, did you have a question? Hi. I just, hi, I'm Joanne Jackson, and I'm um, honored to be on the foundation board and have really proud of how this fellowship program has evolved and flourished. And it's so gratifying to see the range of work sort of presented in one fell swoop, the, the diversity and the creativity of ideas. Um, it's possible that Megan mentioned all this. I missed the first minute or two, but there are a couple new dimensions to the fellowship program, Natasha and Issa. Maybe you mentioned those, um, so I don't want to repeat it, but that you are doing a rolling application this year is one thing that uh, potential applicants might want to know about. And then, again, this may or may not have been mentioned, but one of the highlights uh, that's been incorporated into the fellowship program is at the end of the fellowship year at our annual symposium, um, I know the date for this year's symposium has now been set for June 1st, 2024 at the Julia Morgan Herald Examiner building in downtown Los Angeles. It's really a highlight of that symposium to feature the work, the culmination of the work of the previous year's fellow fellowship recipient. And that gives all the scholarship winners who are present all the supporters of the foundation, the donors, the people who present during the course of the day, all an opportunity to um, sort of see where their, their dollars have gone and some of the energy and creativity that this awards program is fostering and bringing forward. So I just wanna make sure those of you who are thinking about applying, and I hope you will apply, know that there's also a moment in the spotlight at the end of your project. It's great public, but a great public exposure. And I think at the foundation level, we're going to do even more going forward to try to really shine a light on this substantial work that's being done by women in the design field. So 
I'm really excited to see that you all are interested and hope hope you'll get your applications in. That so you I'm going to leave that with you, Natasha and Nisa, if you haven't already mentioned those details. No, I think thank you so much, Joanne, for um, for your words there, and uh, we really appreciate you joining tonight as well. Um, so there is one question in the chat. Let me just read it out loud. I'm not sure. So it says, how much did you deviate from your initial intentions, i.e. what was written on the proposal versus what were you actually able to achieve? Interested in changes in budget and how much time it took. I can answer that because mine deviated a lot. Um, my initial proposal was to do conduct an experiment, experiential and photographic survey of three schools. I didn't do that at all. <laughs> and I think it was, um, I didn't do that at all. And it was partly because of the mentorship I received to like, you know, to just get down to the, try to figure out what the design strategies actually are. Like people wanted to know what, how to design schools to support mental health. Um, my budget was all to support my time. Uh, as a single mom, three kids, I didn't, I didn't have any dreams of buying anything. I just wanted to support my time. I think I had already transitioned out of practice. So I needed every cent <laughs> that I could get to pursue this work. Yeah, um, I think, I mean, I already shared how much my um, project changed, but my proposal did have a budget that did cover the cost of things, um, equipment that I needed right away, um, web, you know, software, things like that. But it also covered like attending events. Um, and, you know, there were some stretch items. And so I think that there was room in that budget to kind of add other things if they if things change during that year. Um, but I, I also think, you know, you could apply for other grants or fellowships as well to augment what your project needs if that became the case. Um, and for example, for my podcast project, I did go after sponsorship once um, I, I decided I wanted to continue. Um, ultimately, I wasn't really successful just because I wasn't able to spend the time going after on marketing as much um, and in, in general on the po podcast anyway, as time went past you know, like two or three years. But um, but, you know, those are also valid ways to continue your project, um, wh whether it's within that one year or years in the future. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, and I hope that answers your question sufficiently. I think they were great answers, yeah. Okay, are there any other questions? And I think also if you end up thinking of additional questions after we do log off today, you can feel free to send them to our awards at AWA at uh, foundation.org. Um, the email should be included on the application. So should be able to find it in the, in one of the links <laughs> that were sent out at the, uh, in this meeting chat. Um, and I'm sure we can get that into a post or <laughs> wherever we need to, to help, um, you know, kind of coordinate that. Okay. Thank you. All right. I want to right. thank you to all of our panelists too for being here today and, um, and giving your insight. And it's, I feel like I learn something every time. <laughs> it's like a new fact or <laughs> a new bit of advice. And uh, you know, I think it's also as as each year goes by, we all change as well and have more time to reflect and how it you know have a chance to look back. Um, so thank you all for giving your the latest insight on, on that time <laughs> in your life. Thank you. Good luck, everyone. Thanks.
Thank, Thank you. you. Good luck. Bye. Bye. Good night.